that uh, that questions is like a little off to the side. Let's just draw that <clears throat> bar in a little. The other one, that one. Yeah, slide it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Well, well, well. All right, we live, boys and girls. Perfect. Good to go. We are actually live this time. We are live. Well, I tell you what, it's uh, it's been a minute. It has. So we had a few months off. Yeah. You know, a little downtime, but <laughs> a little rod building time. Hey, we're back. We'll hang back. out at the house time. Yeah. So yeah, but uh, I, I mean, I said it earlier when I was trying to get prepped for the show. Like I'm just glad we're back up in the penthouse. Oh, absolutely. Mom unlocked the door, let us back up here. Yeah. So you can see we're. We're still going to try to keep our distance and, yeah. and not share, you know, tools on the table and everything. But. That's just because we don't like each other, though. Yeah, That's well, that more too. Of us, but. but yeah, we are back. No more uh, reruns for now, at least. This is actually live <clears throat> May yeah. 12th. So. Absolutely. Well, you know, the, the studio and the production value and, you know, Nick and Jay and, you know, Guffy and Taylor, it's, it's so good that I hate not to be able to show right, the live stuff. Yeah. We put procedures and things in place to make it uh, yes. make it safe. Yeah, and that goes for you know our entire facility. Absolutely. Work. I mean, I think uh, they did a, they did a great job of showing how hard the whole team you yeah. know worked here from you and, and Brooke and the the whole absolutely the entire management team everybody you know I mean we've got disinfectant sprayers downstairs. Uh, everybody's doing masks. We're doing social distancing. We're doing all kinds of stuff to be sure that not only that. You know we're all safe here, but you know all the products and and everything that go out of here are are safe as well. So the guys did a great job doing that. So uh, everybody, you know, yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's a testament to you know how hard we try to work here and everybody everybody doing a heck of a job. Of course, you know, and that goes for our customers as well. Hopefully, yep. you guys are staying safe at home. You know, you guys can see right now that uh, through the video we have taken extra procedures and cautions yep. to disinfect. As these orders go out, make sure our employees are safe. Absolutely. And uh, can get home to their families. You know, everything's in order there. So. And the great news about that is still picking, packing, yep. shipping. Everything's coming in, going out. You know, I, I will say uh, we cannot thank the customers enough uh, for being patient with us. You know, there's, there's a lot of logistics that go on in a, in a situation like this. And uh, it's not easy. And, you know, we understand that, um, you know, there might be a tiny little delay in some stuff, but I think pretty much everybody has understood and, and they've, they've stayed with us and, uh, and then we have, cannot thank you guys enough for, uh, for shopping yeah. at Muddle. And so. things are definitely improving. You know, businesses are opening back up. Our vendors are opening back up. Yeah. We're getting product in daily now, so it's Oh, yeah. I mean, we have, uh, we really, really know the FedEx, UPS, all, <laughs> all those guys and girls that, that drive those trucks. We are yeah. tight knit with them. So, so what are we going to do? That aside, tonight the topic is uh, fly rod builds. So we're going to be talking about uh, spining a multi-piece blank. Yeah. You know, so that's always a common question we get asked. Always. Whether it's fly or Yeah, this goes across travel, the board. Any sure. multi-piece rod, right? Yep. Uh, we're going to talk about ferrule wraps. Again, that goes for not just fly rods, but spinning blanks that are two-piece or three-piece travel rods. Yep. Um, and then, of course, you're going to dive into, uh, what do you got down there? I have uh, here on the uh, RBS Pro Power Wrapper, which is the black track one, by the way. This is that limited edition one. We, uh, I bought it on Hunter's credit card and brought it up here because this is the limited edition one, and boy, it is sharp. I've got a grip here that I glued up. We're going to show you how to turn a custom grip and use the Pro. Uh, and then we have some examples here. And, of course, I uh, have some other little items that I want to show you guys how to use a crafty cutter to do some inletting to make sure that reel seat fits properly. Uh, and then we're also just going to talk about, you know, how to choose the right rod weight, you know, depending on if you're trout fishing or chasing tarpon or, or whatever you're doing there. Uh, and then, of course, also I've got a little special kind of sidebar using the crafty cutter that you inlet a reel seat with, show you guys how to inlet a fighting butt. So if you want to put a coin or a bottle cap or a you know a, one of those cool dome decals and then kind of you know if you want to do some logo work for your rod building business cool that's a great option we see a lot of y'all doing that at home uh, and posting it in the rod builders workshop mm -hmm. so that's a great place for y'all to show off all those skills 
So uh, yeah, I think that that's kind of taken off a lot. I know there's some guys that are building some ice rods and they put those dome decals in it and stuff. So cool. We're gonna think we're gonna do all that. And uh, yeah. what do you think? That's it. Y'all ready to do this? Let's run that intro. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. We are back. Hey, that banner image, that was from our North Carolina trip. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know you guys got a ton of awesome fit, uh, footage. We did. Fish catches, trout. I it, mean. Was, it was the whole deal. You know, and the, the great part about being able to be at the mud hole is when we, get some, uh, when we get some of the new stuff, we get to play with it. Right. So that's, that's really, really nice. And I, and I think, you know, some guys... And uh, girls have been taking advantage of those, no, those new CRB fly blanks. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, that was a cool trip. You know, we went up there to uh, North Carolina. That's in the Pisgah National Forest. So fished on the Davidson River. And uh, that was one of those deals where we, we couldn't have picked a better place, couldn't have picked a better time. Uh, you know, we went and it was last December. Mm -hmm. So it was cool. Uh, Kevin up there that runs Davidson River Outfitters, he is a rod builder himself, so he teaches classes. Uh, he also is a guide, and he's got a whole guide team and, and everybody there with him. So we ran up there to North Carolina, and, and we've you know fished there a number of times. And it's it was one of those deals that were like, where where else are we going to test you know these? So we took the three weight, we took the five weight that we've got for the CRB, and it's uh, where else can you? you know, catch fish after fish after fish, t you know, test it, really put it through its paces. You know, we, we threw streamers, uh, you know, we threw the slump buster, we, we threw, you know, a double nymph rig, we threw a single nymph rig. We did all kinds of things that, you know, we, we know that the customers are going to do with these CRB fly blanks. Right. So that was one of those situations that uh, we brought out the CRB fly because not only did they look cool, but the price is is completely unmatched. You're, you're not going to be able to build a fly rod for under 100 bucks. That is this quality. It looks good. It fishes that good. It just you just can't do it. Yeah. But the CRB fly, we've been working on those for a while. I know we've been talking about them, but you know they've been out for a little bit now, and I think they have been just they've been a hit. You know, yeah. six colors, three weights. They're four piece. Uh, anybody can fish them. They're more of a moderate fast type mm -hmm. of an action. And uh, yeah, they're just flat out cool. I mean, yeah, we got the use of the three weight. So we got the three weight, you know, we got the five weight yep. and the eight weight. So yep. that covers your, your trout fishing. Five weight co covers your versatile freshwater and, you know, very light, you know, saltwater yeah. application. It's the most popular rod weight. And then, you, of course, you got the eight weight that can handle, you know, if you want to catch some redfish, catch yep. some snooks, some baby tarp. Absolutely. Yeah, throw a bass bug. Yeah, a bass you know? bug. Absolutely. Ponds, yeah. So, so that's the it deal. Covered. Got yep. it covered and of course we got the new CRB fly guides to go along with those blanks now and you know I, you did a great job on those that I know that was a lot of work but you know tell us a little bit about that because they're a very unique yeah. guide so we you know went into this with we don't just want an, an everyday fly guide we want to have it a little more you know a little more uh, upscale I guess you could say right so these fly guides so we have a uh, single foot fly guides. Yep. We have snake guides in standard and light wire. That's good. Right. And uh, two color options to go along with that. You know, mm -hmm. your your polish, your chrome. Yep. And then black. Perfect. So what's cool about these, they're actually PVD coated. Yeah. So they're not just a regular, you know, stainless steel finish or, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's just not a hard chrome. A it's, hard it's chrome. It's actually a PVD. It's actually got a nice coating to it, which is going to be, you know, better corrosion resistant. Yeah. It's just a, a you know, stronger finish. It's going to, you know, the life of the, the eternity of these guys is much longer now. It's going to have, sure. you know. And they, they're slicker. You know, they, yeah, they help don't you get wear, a little distance. I yeah, mean, yeah. We, your line we, doesn't wear them down. So. Yeah. And you spend $100 on a fly line, you want it to perform yeah. or you want it to perform. So those guides are, are great. And, of course, you know, across the board, we've got the CRB fly seats now. We've got the guides. Yep. We've got the blanks. We've got your grips that fit the seats. And 
dude, you're ready to rock. That's yeah. that's all there is to it. Exactly. So, and again, at that price point, you're not going to be able to build something that's that good uh, at that price point. So, I mean, you know, we've got the wood insert in them, and we've got all aluminum, yep. and of course, we have the double locking nut with the Delrin insert. Yep. That's for your, you know, salt water seven, eight, nine, that kind of weight. And then of course we've got the single nut there that still has a Delrin insert between the hood and the nut. Mm -hmm. So that's for your, you know, two, three, four, five weight right. type thing. So yeah. and cool. we even uh, you know, something that slips under the radar yeah. is this EVA fly grip. And of course we have the reversed uh, half wells and we also have a full wells version. Yep. Um, but you know, there's a lot of guys out there that don't like cork. Sure. You know, the, the feel of it maybe just doesn't appeal to them. Right. And of course, the price point too. I mean, you know, most cork grips are in your twenty, thirty dollar range sometimes. Yep. Um, you know, even like you know, fifteen to twenty. You know, you can get this one for around ten to twelve, I believe. Yeah. So you know, that really shaves some dollars off and helps you keep that cost down. If that's what, and of course, the feel too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, some people just like it, and we can't fault them for it. And then of course, we have the CRB Color Series. That is a spinning seat. Correct. But of course, it's uh, as your dad would say. It holds a fly reel better than any other metal reel. It seat, does. It period. Does. So yeah, you can you can put that on there, match it up, and uh, you know get some excellent performance. Carry that around in the truck if you know you want to do a little pond hopping after work or yep. fish it anywhere. Honestly, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of cool options, new stuff from CRB that we wanted to show you guys before we really kick this show off and, and really get it. into it. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. So um, why don't you talk about spining a blank? Because we got to start somewhere. So we're going to order our blank, and we're going to get it in, and we're going to spine it, whether it's an ultralight or a fly blank. It's multi-piece. Multi-piece. we got to spine it. Yep. So let's this talk about that. This goes for two-piece, three-piece, four-piece, you know, five. There's and we got a six-piece. We do have, I was going to say, there's not many five or six-piece blanks out there, but you got one. we have two models in the uh, Native series that are six-piece. Yeah. Uh, for you guys that really like to, you know, pack small. Absolutely. Something you can keep behind, you know, you get the seat in your truck, or even if you're yeah. going to Mexico or South America, that you can Absolutely. take uh, as a carry-on. Or if you got to go visit the in-laws and, you know, you need to hide a, a fly rod under your, yeah. under the seat in the minivan just so you can duck out when things start to get exactly. hairy. Exactly. So. so what I've got here is one of our CRB uh, four-piece fly blanks. So when starting out spining a multi-piece blank, I always like to start with the tip section. Mm -hmm. And I've already put a little piece of tape on here, kind of as a flag, as an indicator, to show you guys uh, kind of where this is going to, you know, when you spine it, it's going to pop into place, right? Right. So as you would spine any other blank, now with the tip, you know, I think this might be maybe a five or an eight weight. It's a little bit, you know, has a little more power on the tip. Yep. When you're dealing with a two, a three, a four weight, be extra careful on the tip section. You know, don't go past 90. Um, just be cautious because there's not a lot of material out here on the tip and right. you want to be careful. So, you know, just like any other rod blank, we're going to put a slight bend in, to, you know, in it. And you can do this on a countertop you know, preferably because you want to kind of have it a little bit off the ground, right? Yep. Um, and you're dealing with a shorter section, obviously. So pretty simple. Put a little bit of a deflection into it. And as I rotate this, let's see if I can get that for you guys. Sorry there. We good on the camera? So there's a little spine there, but when it turns, that's kind of where it locks in right there on top. And like I said, I've already made the, the mark for you guys so you can see it. You know, typically you can use a China marker. You know, if you want to hold that spot right there, you can come in with your China marker and make a mark there, or you can simply put a piece of masking tape around it, make a mark with a pen if you wanted to, yep. or use a flag like I've got here. So essentially what you want to do is we're doing one section at a time. So once we have our tip section, we got that done, we'll do our next section, right? Same thing, slight deflection. We'll roll it to find our spine, whatever seems to be the strongest axis. You know, typically there are two. One is a stronger, one's a weaker. Yep. Um, in some cases, there might not be a spine, right? And in that case, we would just go with the straightest axis. Sure. So, same thing, we'd make our mark on this one, set it down. But as you'll notice, when you get towards, especially the two bottom sections, yeah. they're going to be stiffer, right? They're going to be a little bit harder to roll. For sure. The third section, you can still manage just a slight bend to it. You know, you can kind of work with it. You might be able to get a, a spine out of that. 
make your mark. We'll set that down. Now the last section, I'm not even going to try it with because it's just, it's your butt section. It's going to be too stiff. Yeah. You're not going to be able to find your spine. Yeah. So this one, you really just want to look down at, find your straightest axis, axis, mark that, and you're good to go. Yep. Now when we're done, we're going to come back in and simply, you're going to line up all your marks. Just like that. Oh, that's the, the right one. Did you pull that other blank? Yeah, I think we got switched up on blanks, but yeah, that's all right. It'll still work. Yep. So simply just put all the sections together, just like that. And all you do is line up your marks, and that's where your guys will fall. Yep. Simple as that. Perfect. And that is, again, whether you're building a fly rod or whether you're building an ultralight, it doesn't matter. As long as you've got a, you know, a travel piece, you know, there's a lot of great travel rods in there uh, that are you know, kind of derivatives of some of the spinning series. You know, we have a TFW, mm -hmm. we have a TR series. So we have two levels of travel rods. Um, of course, we've got the MHX fly, we've got CRB fly. Um, you know, we carry, we carry Sage. So that's another great name from the fly thing. So all of those are going to, you know, take care of the multi-piece spine. Exactly. So absolutely. All right, so we need to give something away. Uh, let's answer some questions first. Okay. While the guys are getting a uh, getting a giveaway, there we're going to do a third place giveaway, which is a fly guide kit. And speaking of that, one of the guys, Eric Christensen, is asking, "What is the benefit to a single foot guide versus a double foot on a fly rod?" You know, Eric, there for me, there is uh, more of just I don't want to wrap two guide wraps. Um, but you know, there, there is a little more than that. So when you look at a snake guide, you know, it has two feet and then it has a hoop in it. Now there's a number of you know, different types. You have a light wire, you have a standard wire. You know, um, I would say the vast majority have a double footed snake on there. And I have never really seen uh, a benefit over a snake or a single foot. You know, some of the guys say, oh, well, it weighs more or it, whatever. It doesn't because you're still using one piece of wire. And if you look at a snake guide, you have a foot and a hoop and a foot. When you have a single foot guide, you have a foot, a hoop, and then the foot comes back this way. So you're really using the same amount of wire. Right. It's the same weight. It's just you only have one foot instead of two feet. Um, I, you know, I do have on, this is one of the natives. So this is a native, of course I got it together. I was throwing it earlier. So this is the native in the four weight, or no, I'm sorry. This is the seven, six, three weight. I'm sorry. So seven, six, three weight. I've got the single foots on here. Um, really when I go lighter like this, I do like the single foot on a very light rod or lighter rod. Um, depending on the action, I want to be able to make sure it kind of maintains the same uh, you know, feel that you get when it's just a plain blank. Uh, sometimes if, if you get real heavy on thread wraps and long thread wraps and, and heavy on finish, you know, you're spreading out that foot a little more. Um, do I believe that it adjusts the blank action or weight? Again, I mean, if we're talking a two weight, a three weight, a one weight, you know, maybe. Um, but to be honest, I just really like the look of these single foots on this. Um, you know, you do have a little bit less thread, you get a little bit less finish. But for, for me, I think it looks great. I think the single foots on a, on a lighter rod uh, just perform very, very well. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of aesthetics. I mean, I, I'm not going to argue, you know, about weight and you know, performance and, and things like that on singles and, and snakes. But so that's, I know we could, we could talk longer about that, but yeah, it's, that's really just the differences. So you got that. Um, let's talk about, can you explain the weight of fly rods and what they mean? That's Todd. Uh, so when you have a regular spinning rod, a casting rod, something like that, they give a line rating, mm -hmm. right? So your line rating and your lure rating 
is based on what the manufacturer believes that that rod blank can handle. You know, you, you can't take a rod blank that uh, says it can only handle a half ounce and put a three ounce on it and try to throw it. You might get away with it, but you're probably going to blow it up. So remember, you're throwing a lure, and the line's connected to the lure on a spinning rod, a casting rod, surf rod, all those. With a fly rod, you are throwing the line that is weighed in grains. So you're throwing the line, and you're delivering a fly. So, and we could go, you know, we could get really advanced in this with, you know, uh, the common sense and, and all of that stuff. But think of it like your five weight rod is designed to throw a grain weight of line that is measured in the first 30 feet. And uh, AFTA, which is kind of the governing body of all that fly stuff, gives you a weight range. Um, and for example, right in the middle of the weight range of an eight weight is 210 grains. So that's measured from the front of that fly line, 30 feet back. That's the standard, eight weight, 210 grains. So when you look at an eight weight rod, it's supposed to perform with 210 grain line, and that's how you match those up. Now, whew, there is a lot more that kind of goes into that. You know, some guys overline rods because maybe the rod is very stiff or it has a lot of midsection and, and butt power and stuff like that, or it makes it a little easier to throw if you've got a heavier line. And, you know, then there's also line manufacturers that have a heavy headed shooting line that, you know, maybe the, the fly line is 243 grains which now is pushing it into a nine weight category, but because the eight weight is fast or stiff, uh, it can handle it and it makes it easier to throw for some people. So you can muddy the water really, really quickly, but the long and short of it is a five weight is in a category where it is supposed to throw a line that has a certain grain weight in the first 30 feet of it. And it goes all the way from you know, a zero weight to a 16 weight and that's, that's kind of how they're done. So, you know, from there you have fast action, moderate, slows, you have all of that, but, you know, you, you wouldn't take an eight weight line and put it on a one weight rod. It just wouldn't work because of the grain weights. So that's, uh, again, that's, that could be an hour show just on that. <laughs> but, so there you go. Yeah, that was a good explanation. So I think to hit on uh, Mike's question here, which weight rod would you choose to give your, uh, your first try at rod building? Um, you know, if we're speaking fly rods, Mike, I would definitely go with probably a five weight. Yep. Five weight's going to be your most versatile. Uh, of course, this all depends on where you live, but as a general rule of thumb, it, it, you know, five weight can do a lot of great trout fishing. Yep. Can cover a really broad range there. Um, and even fresh, uh, not freshwater, but, you know, if you're fishing for bass or panfish, yep. you can definitely use a five weight for those too. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those... I believe the study not too long ago was that the five weights outsold every other rod weight uh, in, you know, across those. So, I mean, everybody that trout fishes, anybody that has a fly rod and they go to a pond or catch bluegill or, you know, even guys in saltwater, you know, the, the five weight is really, it's the first rod I got when I was a young kid at, at grandma's house catching panfish. Yeah. So, uh, five weights, probably the deal. Yep. So. Um, let me answer Ken's question here. Can you discuss the differences between grip styles and which type, which, uh, when to use which type? Uh, Ken, first, let me say congratulations because you are the third place giveaway winner. So that is going to be a fly guide kit. So, uh, Ken, congratulations there. And, uh, you know, then you can get your uh, guide set kit. We'll get you a grip. You know, we'll talk about that. Uh, so this here is a full wells grip, right? And there's a couple different ways you can go about that. You can see uh, there, that's, that's considered a full wells, right? The reason it is, it's got a well here and a well here, hump in the middle, full wells grip, right? That is a six weight. That's our boy Guffy in the back there. He's, he's using that for salt water. Now, this is a reverse half wells. So we've got a well back here, and this is something that is typically used on your freshwater rods, uh, your lighter stuff from, you know, one weight up to a five weight. And then on your full wells, that's going to be, you know, from your five, if you have a crossover, because I do have a crossover. You know, I have a couple five weights that are really stout. 
So I, I, I cross them over a little. I, you know, I use them for bigger bass flies, use them in some lighter salt water. So I actually run a <clears throat> full wells grip and a fighting butt on my five weight. That one is a six weight. That's that native. So that one right there is, yep, it is the six weight. It's a beautiful blue color there. Got the uh, polished reel seat with the full wells there. And you can see uh, that was a custom grip. Very similar to the one I got here. So we, we did one there for Guff, and uh, that's, your, that's your full well. So if it was me, you know, kind of the standard would just be, hey, yeah, you got a, you got a, a five weight, you ought to do this. Uh, if you've got this, you know, do a, uh, if you got an eight weight, do a full wells. But, you know, of course, to say that, and then there's a four weight with a very, very light taper full wells in it. So. Might even run it on a four weight. We just have a thinner kind of thinner wells in it. So yeah, that's uh, that's it. And uh, yeah, congratulations, Ken. Thanks for the question. Enjoy that fly guide kit. It's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, there's different variations and shapes, and you know. Oh, you we can get wild. You can get endless with we it. We can that, get wild. You know, there's two basic yep. basic grips for fly grips. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Jim from YouTube, question for guides on fly rods. I've read that some fly rods have two stripper guides. Mm -hmm. Why is this necessary? So Jim, my two cents on this is um, you're probably going to find rods that have two stripper guides are going to be your heavier weights, Yep. right? Mm -hmm. You know, anywhere from, what would you say, maybe a 7 and 8 and up? Yeah. You know, yep. you're probably going to be dealing with like a 16 and a 12 mm -hmm. or a 12 and a 10 is a, is a, you know, the common two sizes. Right. Um, you know, once you start getting to those smaller, you know, six weights and, and under, that's when you're going to see, you know, one stripping guide. Yeah. Um, and there's a version of it right there. Yeah, so there's two strippers there. That's a 16 and a 12. Uh, and that is, you know, salt water. This is actually a nine weight. So we, we ran it on that. But yeah, you know, you, you typically will see two strippers on, you know, just like what you said. And honestly, sometimes you see three. You see three mm -hmm. strippers uh, typically on a 11, 12 weight and above. Uh, so. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Jeff from Facebook, what's the best way to seal your grip? Uh, Jeff, the best way is a cork seal. Uh, so cork seal is a, you know it's a product that um, you know after if you buy the grip that's already pre-made or if you make your own, uh, it's a product that you can actually you know put over the top of that grip. Um, it sets up and it kind of acts like a sealant pretty much. Yes. It, it keeps the dirt, the grime, the water. Mm -hmm out of your cork because cork is a natural material yep. it's porous it likes you know other materials to you know to come in oh yeah so it keeps everything out yep absolutely all right so uh you want to get ready to wrap a ferrule yep uh so that we and i'll kind of look at some some questions here while you're kind of setting up cool um we did uh how do you determine the size of the guides uh you know there is a number of different places out there uh, us included, that we do provide spacing and sizing. Um, really that, there is a little variation, you know, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, probably if you look at a five weight from a bunch of different manufacturers, you're going to see a, a single stripper guide that's a size 12. And then, you know, if you go down to snakes, you'll probably see it'll go a three, a couple twos and a couple ones, and then maybe some size one o's, something like that. But there is some variation. You know, you don't you don't want uh, size five snake guides on a five weight. Um, it's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of literature out there on it. Uh, we are always happy to help. We have the spacing, we have the sizing, we have guide kits. Um, you know, we've got CRB kits, we have snake brand kits, we have REC titanium alloy kits. We've got all kinds of stuff like that. And of course, uh, you know, either one of us and any one of the dozen sales team downstairs can help you. You know, if you want to really kind of pick it apart and buy individual guides and, and kind of dissect it, always happy to give our two cents on that. So uh, again, a lot of, lot of resources out there for that and, you know, including us here under this roof uh, or, you know, different manufacturers. And you can vary a little bit, but like I said, you know, you don't want to put a size one on a 12 weight, and you don't want to put a size five on a two weight. So, uh, you know, you got a little leeway there. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I'm all set up here. All set up. Ready I see you. I see you. All right. So we're going to do a quick ferrule wrap for you guys, just show you um, how it's done. And, you know, we're going to 
talk about a few tips and tricks, you know, if your guy happens to be close to that feral wrap, what do you do? Or if <clears> it's a few inches away, what do you do? So it's a great point. First, we're going to start off with our blank extension tool. So this little tool, not only for feral wraps, comes in really handy for other stuff too. Oh, there. But for this application, what I have done is you will notice there is some half inch masking tape. Um, basically, that's going to act like a feral, or not a feral, excuse me, a, uh, an arbor for me. So typically, when you slide this over the end, since this is tapered, you know, if you push it all the way, it's going to stop about right there. It's going to have a little bit of wiggle room in there, right? Sure. So what I've done is I've actually backed off this masking tape a little bit towards the tip. So when I do slide this on, it's going to stop about there, and it's really snug. There's no wiggle room. And when I put this in my wrapper, it's going to stay there and just more secure, right? Nice, nice. So, and the reason this blank extension tool helps is when I actually do put this in my stands. Let me slide this guy over here. Okay. Is, you know, if you would have not, if you don't use the blank extension tool, what ends up happening is your, the end of your ferrule is, is going to sit right on your rod stand, right on the V insert. So you don't want that. So this allows you to actually back that edge off a little bit towards the middle of your wrapper so you have some room to work with there. All right, put my bands on and let's start this wrap. So the reason we actually do a ferrule wrap is to basically protect that edge, the edge of your rod blank. Just acts as kind of a buffer, a little extra protection, you know, because we don't want any, you know, more than likely, the blanks that, you know, the modern blanks are all, they have reinforced ferrules, yep. right? But why not add a little bit more security there? For sure. And really, it's, it's more or less so that if you get a little aggressive when you're putting your rod together, um, it, it keeps that ferrule from actually opening and, and splitting. Right. You know, it's, it's not a situation, like Hunter said, there's, I mean, really, any more across every manufacturer, you know, they're going to have reinforced ferrules. So it's just something that we know we need to take care of. But with this, it just adds a little bit extra protection from it actually splitting. So um, while you're doing that, I'm going to hit a couple of questions because there's a lot. Um, <clears throat> Connie, when you spine a spinning rod versus a fly rod, do you put the guides on the opposite side from your marks? Connie, uh, when you spine a fly rod and a spinning rod, they're the same. So when you... Let me steal this guy here. So when you spine a blank like this, how you would spine a spinning rod, the guides go on the inside. Same with a fly rod. So think of it as when you're holding the fly rod like this, all your guides are on the underside. When you're holding a spinning rod, all your guides are on the underside. So spine it like this, make your mark on the inside, and then you're going to put it on the inside like that. So. Sorry, I didn't mean to grab your, no, you're good. Like get my trusty old hand sanitizer out. Good idea. Doesn't hurt, right? That's it. <laughs> yeah, right? Kind of kind of put it everywhere. All right. Um, is there any conversion between a fly rod weight and a rod power like a five weight comparable to a midi medium power spinning or casting rod? Brandon, actually, there, there's really not. We don't have a table for that. Um, it, it kind of goes back to the common sense thing. And when I say common sense, I don't mean like, hey, don't stick your hand in a wood chipper common sense. Uh, the common sense uh, is where you actually measure the deflection of a blank. So, you know, when we put a rod blank on a deflection chart, the common sense is actually where you take pennies and as you add pennies to the bag, it actually deflects the blank and that's how you figure out what the, uh, you know, um, what am I trying to say? The, uh, the, the power. power of that rod. So, you know, if you were to do that, you could technically do that on a casting rod, a spinning blank, any of those blanks and figure out what type uh, or what weight fly rod that it would equate to. But it's a lot of work. And to be honest with you, uh, like a medium heavy power spinning rod is going to be like a 16 weight fly rod. It's amazing how even if you get a light power blank or a medium light power blank, how it translates into like a nine weight. I mean, uh, one of the little in-house secrets here is the SJ9000. 
uh, that blank, we actually throw a nine white line on it. So <laughs> that is, what is that? The 9,000 is 7.6? Seven, 7.6. Six. Seven, six. Yeah. Uh, do, we make, do we still make the 9,600? I don't know. Let's check on that. Yeah. So there's an SJ 9,000. It's 7.6. We throw a nine white line on it. So when you look at the specs on it, it's like a 16th to 3 sixteenths or something. Like you would think well, it would be much lighter than that. But then when you, when you actually you know, deflect the blank out and figure out what grain weight that it would take to throw it, it turns out to be a nine weight. So yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine what like an MB843 would be. It would be like, <laughs> it'd be like a 14 weight or something. Uh, it's, you know, so yeah, that's kind of, there is not a conversion easy chart where you just plug in, I have a five weight from CRB or I have an MB843, what kind of fly rod it is. There, there is a lot more than that. So go ahead, cool. So I wanna hit on Brian's question real quick. How do you know how long to wrap ferrule? Brian, that's a great question. So when I wrap my ferrules, I typically go, I would say total length. Now, this one's not done yet. I would say maybe half inch, three quarters of an inch, okay. if that. Not okay. too long, because all you're doing is reinforcing that, that very end of it, right? You're not, yep. you're not going halfway down the rod section. No. So, and <clears throat> as you can see here, I've tried to turn this so you guys can get a little bit better angle. It looks pretty good. Okay, we'll, we'll work with, oh, oh, the tension around. Let me try a little bit this way. Okay, uh, let me go back. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I can't figure it. Trying okay. to hold your mouth Okay, on. I like that a little there bit. Okay, go. perfect. So, as you can see, I'm gonna use the end of this rod as a kind of a pointer too. As you can see, I didn't go all the way to the edge. I left maybe like a eighth inch, 16th inch gap here. Because um, if you go too far, you're just running the risk of a headache. You're going to run that thread off the edge. Yep. Just, just stop a little bit before. And you can always actually, you know, you can start this wrap, say, in here. And then once you get four or five wraps in to where you got that tag in secured, mm -hmm. you can just push those threads over a little bit. Burnish it over. And you can put it right where you want to, right? Well, and the great part about that is you're going to a, you're going from a thinner part of the blank in di outer diameter to a thicker part. So it's not, as you move it a little bit, it's not going to loosen and want to unravel on right. it. Right. Yeah. So um, I'd probably go, you know, maybe a little bit longer. You know, we can keep wrapping, wrapping, wrapping. Um, but, you know, I'd probably stop it somewhere in the range of there. Maybe, a, you know, I'd go maybe four or five more wraps, then put my tag in or my, my loop in. Yeah. And I'd finish that wrap off and I'd be done. That's, that's all you really need. These wraps don't need to be an inch, inch and a half long. Yeah. That's all you need, a little bit of security. Now, if, let's say my guide happens to fall maybe somewhere in, we got to zoom again right here, guys? Just for, uh, just so we're here. Okay, perfect. Let's say our guide falls somewhere in this range. So we're pretty far up. We're four, five, six inches up from the end of the butt uh, or the edge of this ferrule here. If a guide falls in that range, I would put it there, no problem, you're good to go. If it happens to fall maybe in this range, you know, maybe a couple inches up from the edge of that ferrule, I would actually incorporate this guide, if it fell in this, in this general area, I would incorporate that guide into this wrap. And it's very simple, all you gotta do is move it down just a hair, and all you gotta do is keep wrapping, keep wrapping, finish that, you know, go up into the guide foot and just complete all into one. Um, you know, that couple inches, half inch of a difference in a, you know, a, a, what am I trying to say, a guide layout yeah. is not going to make any no. difference. You're not going to notice at all. Nope. So here's a couple examples real quick. Nick, stay right there tight. So here would be, Got it. right, there would be if, whoop, hang on, let me get out here. All right. So here would be, you see that ferrule wrap, and then you see where the guide wrap starts. Sorry, I know I, it's kind of the thread blends in there. But you can see, like Hunter was saying, the guide is out away from the ferrule a little. So leave it there. Because that, if you extended that ferrule wrap all the way to that guide, come on. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Yeah, that's, that's a stretch. That's, in, that's an inch, inch and a half, probably yeah, at least. That's ridiculous. Now, here up on the second, or actually this would be the third section, this one was close enough to incorporate. Let me back this up just a little. Yeah. So there's your, you can see there's a ferrule wrap with the guide in it. 
So that's close enough, right? Yep. And it might have even fallen a little away from the ferrule, but then we just backed it up just a hair so you didn't get some ridiculously yeah. long ferrule if it, wrap. If it was probably somewhere in here, all you got to do is scoot it down to there, incorporate your wrap, and then wrap on this side, you're good to go. Good to go. Cool. Perfect. Those are like a few solid examples for the, yeah. for the folks at home. Um, let me get a couple here really quick. Anthony, would you use a counterweight fighting butt and a very long rod? Um, I wouldn't. Uh, but the reason I wouldn't is just, you know, you've got a pretty good size fly reel on the end there. You know, that, that gives you a little bit of, that gives you a little bit of weight, you know, kind of in, uh, in the butt there. Um, you know, s some rods do have what they call a higher swing weight, which means it does, it does feel a little tip heavy. Um, but uh, I fish a lot of fly reels that are, that are quite heavy, so I don't ever really see the need to, but I mean, you, you technically could. I've never added one in, um, and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, recommend it. Um, let's see, fly fishing tarpon and reds, what weight would you guys recommend? Uh, Mike, depending on how big those tarpon are uh, and how big those redfish are, I'm going to just go with an eight weight. You know, we catch tarpon here in central Florida on an eight weight, you know, up to 15 pounds and more. Uh, but you know, anything you start to get to like a 40 pound fish or a 30 pound fish, I probably wouldn't want to do it consistently on an eight weight. Yeah, it just happens and it's fun. But if I'm targeting redfish and, and tarpon, uh, you know, maybe a, maybe a tarpon that's like this, maybe he's 10 pounds, maybe a redfish is 10 pounds, uh, which would be, you know, a pretty good size fish. That's a, probably a 30, 32 inch fish here. Um, that's an eight weight, you know. Uh, and again, that falls into that category of just like a five weight's probably the most common freshwater, the eight weight's probably the most common saltwater that you could, Absolutely. you could fly to the Bahamas and catch a bonefish on it. You could fish all over the state of Florida and sea trout and redfish and, and all that stuff. So um, I would probably just do an eight weight because it will, you know, it'll serve you for many, many years to come. Um, Chuck asks, what weight would be good for pike fishing? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's not always with the pike. It's not always fighting the fish, it's throwing the meat. It's throwing those big articulated flies that you guys throw for those pike. And, you know, uh, when you look at, I, I know Sage made a, their bass line of rods that were grain weighted, you know, and they made a pike and muskie that was like 400 and something, I think. And, it, you know, it equated to like a 12 weight. Yeah. But it was not a 12 weight because you need a 12 weight to fight a pike but you need that four or 500 grains to throw that fly that they're gonna eat, which is, is cool. <laughs> I love it, I love it. But yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna need something that's gonna throw those big flies. I would start with whatever fly that you've got and maybe work backwards a little bit because you know, it's not the pike that's gonna kill you, it's that giant fly that more than likely you're probably throwing for them. Yeah. So, um, let's see, I had a, let me find it real What'd quick. You had a good question. Where was it? Where was it? Oh, here it is. Uh, Val from Facebook, is the rod weight a determining factor for the application of a fighting butt, or can you use That's one good. on any size rod? So Val, typically, um, you'd start using a fighting butt on maybe... I'm going to start getting ready for Yeah, that. sure. I would say uh, a fly rod around the five or six weight range, and up is when you would use a fighting butt. But, not to say you can't use a fighting butt on rods that are smaller in weight. That kind of comes down to the personal preference thing. Um, you know, a fighting butt is not necessarily needed, let's say, on a two weight. Yeah, um, that's it's, a nine. It's and that's kind of six, overkill, likewise. but I would say, generally speaking, a six weight and up is when you're going to start using a fighting butt. Because more than likely, you know, you're probably going to start getting to bigger fish. Um, you're going to need to start using your reel and not just, you know, stripping in the line to, to catch those fish or bring them to the boat. Um, so more than likely your, you know, your rod's going to be, you know, around your hip or in your stomach and that's where you need that fighting butt. So that's that. Take another question here. Let's see. Uh, what is this? Uh, when you dry, dry the rod, do you dry the entire length and break it into sections for drying? Uh, Anthony, I actually, I dry it in its complete length, whether it's a nine footer, whether it's a 10 footer. Uh, but just make sure that you properly support it. Um, you know, with a, 
If I'm working on an MB874 that's 7.3, I'll use the dryer and then one stand probably halfway or so out. Um, but if I'm using, if I've got a nine foot fly rod, and especially because that tip will wanna, you know, or if you run that single stand all the way out of the tip and then you get a belly and then your finish will all, I mean, I'll probably have, I'll have an RDS with a wire chuck, especially. And then I'll probably run three stands. You know, uh, sometimes I use them on TV trays. Sometimes I use a long workbench. <laughs> it just depends on what I've got and what room or whatever. But yeah, I'm, I'm using probably three stands on a nine or a 10 white. So, yep. Uh, Bob, do you typically wrap the tip top and how? Um, so, yes, you can. Do we have uh, get a tip section anywhere? I wrapped this one. Okay, perfect. So, Whew. you can see here, I'm going to zoom real quick on that. Chris did wrap the tip on this one, um, but as you can see, let me get a zoom real quick there. Uh, I, I'm not going to count those threads, yeah. but I would say yeah. it might be about five or six turns. Really paid off for me. R really, the only thing you're doing there is to seal off that edge. Um, Honestly, it's probably more cosmetic than anything. Yeah. Uh, it's a little safety, uh, you know, precaution. All you're doing is really sealing the end uh, of that uh, tip barrel, pretty much. Uh, and then you can, you know, add your little bitty thread wrap, and then add a little, uh, little bit of finish, and and that's it. Uh, it's certainly not required. No. You can honestly just glue the tip on there. I do uh, add <laughs> finish, whether I put thread yes, or not. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's a good point. The thread, the thread itself is not required. Um, you know, pretty much you, you would use an adhesive um, or a hot melt to add yep. the tip, the tip top to the tip, <laughs> and then uh, you can simply add just a little little spot of, of, of finish on there, and it's perfectly good. You don't really have have to use the thread. That's it. The reason I did it on that is because that that green color of the native, and I was using a very contrasting thread, so. I felt like with the red thread on that green blank, if, if I didn't put a little on the tip, it, it might not feel complete. Yeah. And it catches more fish. <laughs> if, if that's what you think in your head, <laughs> that's I mean, it. it works. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Can you tell we're excited to be back? I don't know. <laughs> you know? Uh, Pete, A or D size thread on the ferrule wrap? Um, well, lost it there. Is one better than the other? Uh, Pete, typically on fly rods, we're going to use size A. Uh, or even B thread. D, uh, not necessary unless you're going up into the, uh, you know, 9, 10, 12 weight range. Um, even then, A, A or B is more than sufficient. Yeah, so. still use an A for yeah. sure. What else cool. we got? What else we got? Uh, Let me scroll up a little bit. There we go. Um, do you guys run line through the guides prior to wrapping to make sure the flow is good? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and this goes not just for fly rods. This is any rod that you ever build. Yep. You always want to, um, you know, either use tape or use uh, guide tubing is what we typically use um, to, you know, affix the guides to the blank, get your guide spacing right. Um, you can even, you know, you pretty much want to do static deflection where you run the line through the guides, uh, make it deflect, and see where your sharp angles are. If there's any sharp angles um, you know, between the guides, you either need to add a guide somewhere, put those guides closer together. Um, you definitely want to do that with any rod bill that you do. Yep. All righty. Uh, can you strip down a seven foot ultralight spinning or casting rod and build a fly rod? Keith, you can, uh, especially if it's an ultralight, but be prepared that, you know, it, it might be a four weight, it might turn out to be a six weight, it might, you know, you, you just don't know unless you use the common sense of, you know, way of figuring out what grain weight will deflect it. Or I've just kind of winged it, you know. I just went ahead and since you've already got the blank and you just want to strip it down, if you want to experiment a little, do it, you know. Build one out and then take a couple different fly lines and go out in the yard or go to the pond and just get a feel for it, you know? I mean, there's so many different fly lines and, and I, I have always cast it a lot by feel, even from, you know, learning how to do it a long time ago, like way longer than I'm, <laughs> but it's, 
for me, it's feel. You know, some people say, well, no, I really like that eight weight line on that eight weight rod, and that's great. I might not like that. Uh, it's, it's all about feel. So yeah, take you a couple different fly lines, go down there, uh, tape it up, put some guide tubing, or go ahead and wrap it, and then take it down there. And you might find that, you know, it might be a four, might be a five weight, might be a three weight, but you might love it. Yeah. So that would be a cool, you know, having a seven footer, that would be, would be a bluegill machine or, you know, some really tight, tight creeks and stuff. So Certainly. yeah, cool. You want to do a giveaway before we get started? Yeah, that? yeah, give it away. All right. So our runner up giveaway for tonight is the, uh, is your choice of a fly handle kit. And that's going to be, what do you got here? Oh, there it is. Peggy Boyless, AKA Jim. Uh oh, what's uh? Is that is that husband using the wife's account again? Could be. I think didn't that happen last time? I think that was like, hey Rick here using Tammy's account or whatever. Looks you know, like, like that one's from uh from YouTube. That's I YouTube. Think. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. We're switch. Okay. YouTube. Yeah. Peggy Boyless, aka Jim. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Congratulations, you got the fly handle kit. Perfect. Um. All right. Good job. Cool. What you so, got? Uh, let's do shaping a custom grip, okay? Uh, I'm gonna kind of walk you guys through a little start to finish. Um, I'll show you a little kind of the glimpse of this one that I showed you earlier. So, and I'll walk you through why that I do this. Because sometimes, you know, uh, I come up with some harebrained ideas. I mean, just, just call the wife, she knows. And sometimes they pay off and sometimes they don't, but in this, case it did. So this here uh, is a rod that we did for Guffy. It's the native six weight and he wanted to do something kind of special and what we did is we used our high grade cork rings and then we also used the composite. So the composite does a couple things. It not only looks incredibly sharp but where it really pays off and I've got a couple back here that I end up just using it on all mine, when I turn a custom grip, because then you have to inlet <clears throat> this section here. So imagine this is what this looks like. So you see that's an inlet there, and that's where the real seat fits inside of it. Now, we use a tool called a crafty cutter. And a crafty cutter is this little guy here that then has two little blades on the outside. They look like wings. They're interchangeable. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to cut that hole in the grip to create an inlet to fit one of those real seats. Now, not every fly seat requires an inlet. You know, uh, whether you're using that spinning seat, uh, we do have some CRV fly seats that, you know, are the AFS. So you'll see there's an AFS and then there's an AFS R. The R has the recess in it. So that has an inlet. So you'll need something like this if you do a custom grip. Or if you just want to go ahead and buy one that is already done, that is fine too. So that's where the crafty cutter comes in. So when you cut cork, and you guys have known this, if you have done anything with cork, whether you've been reaming it, whether you accidentally split it or whatever, because it's a natural, pretty much a bark, if you bust it or you try to cut it, it might want to chip at it, you know, uh, and then you'll take chunks out of it. And you can see that's how natural cork is. It has all these voids in it, um, and it's technically just the natural way that cork is, and it'll take a chunk out. The great part about these composite rings is they don't, like, chip on you. You know, you don't take chunks out of it. So it's a very, very clean cut, and you know, you don't end up having a big chunk of cork hanging out of your inlet. Then when you make the real seat up in it, and then it's like, well, that, that doesn't look good. You know, so you've got this. It, it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it gives a little. So when you cut it and it's a tight fit, it's, it just looks perfect. So you'll see a lot of the grips that I do um, on all my kind of custom cork. You'll see it comes in two widths. It comes in a half and a quarter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it comes in a half and a quarter. Or what you can do is you can then put this in the cork jig 
that you've used before and slice it even thinner. Yep. So um, I don't know if I've got, I don't think I've got one that's even thinner, but you can actually take it and cut it again. So that's the cool part about that. But let me talk about prep for the mandrel because we have to glue these cork rings together, right? And you can see I've done that here. You've got your mandrel. This is, we've got four or five sizes? I think there's maybe five or six. Okay, five or six sizes. They do have the uh, live center in it. So if you do have a lathe at home, these are an 18 inch, right? Yeah, 18 inch, they come in five or six sizes. We'll chuck into, you know, the RBS Pro, we'll chuck into your lathe and then also work in a live center. So these are something, you might as well buy like four or five of them. Have them on hand because, you know, if you're gluing cork up one day, if you're taking some of the, you know, the EVA uh, sections and you want to do some wild stuff, I mean, you know, I think anybody that is a part of any rod builder group and the Mud Hole Live, you know, is, is familiar with some of the killer work that Billy Vavona does. You know, he does logos and wild designs and all that. And he does it all with EVA, cor EVA blocks. He puts it on a mandrel and he turns it. So it's something cool to explore. Uh, you know, we have like a cork handle creation kit that puts all that stuff in there if you want to do that. Uh, we have the EVA one. So it's, it's really cool. It's, it's something that, you know, if you want to get into it, I'd get into it. So let me find this stuff. This is the turning mandrel wax. So what can happen is you can, actually, you can actually glue your rings to the mandrel. And it happens to everybody. It happened to me, it's happened to him. It just is, it's one of those rite of passages, right? So this is the mandrel turning wax. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little bit on a paper towel, and then I'm gonna chuck it into a drill. You don't need a ton of this. And actually a lot of the times I will heat this mandrel a little bit. Um, I will clean it first. So, you know, if you, if you need to go to whatever, um, you know, black market that you need to find rubbing alcohol these days, uh, or, you know, maybe use acetone or something, clean it off, and then I actually take, and I get it in the drill, and then I'm gonna wax it, right? And, you know, imagine we wax it, left it on a haze, and then feel like that. I don't think anybody needs to hear that in my microphone any more than that. So um, wax the mandrel, please, because otherwise uh, you might have a beautiful cork grip uh, that's wonderful to be displayed in your cabinet because you can't get it off the mandrel and put it on your rod. So now that we've got this done, uh, I tend to just, you know, uh, the, the cork grip, depending on what you want, will be maybe seven inches, maybe seven and a half, maybe eight. If you're, you know, like Michael Jordan, got big giant hands, you need, you need like a, a much longer cork. So that's the best part about this is if you're building it for, uh, you know, a, a wife or a girlfriend or mother, or, you know, and maybe they have a little bit smaller hands, you can turn that grip down a little more. Uh, maybe you've got, you know, arthritis or something and you need the grip to be a larger outer diameter um, because it's more comfortable. This is another great option for you as well. So there is kind of a right way and a wrong way to glue these up, and I'll show you. I tend to take a cork ring and I put it on, kind of get it centered there. What I usually do is, depending on how I want this to lay out, you can see I have composite on each end, and then I've got, this is the, what are these, the burnt rings? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got composite, and then I've got two burnt rings here, so I have Five rings here, five rings here. I got one in the middle, two here. Now remember, these are quarter inch, these are half inch. They're gonna add up, right? So we gotta do a little math. But this is, you know, how you map it out, and then I stack it. So I'll take it and I'll put one down, then another one, and then I'll stack it because we've all, it, it falls under that, uh, you know, measure twice and cut once kind of deal. So you want to stack the cork exactly how it's going to go on in reverse, right? This one is a mirror image, so you can stack it just like this. And then I'm actually going to put, I'll actually put this one on. So we're going to put the composite on the outside. We're good. 
Yeah, everybody still getting it? Are we okay? Perfect. All right, so I've got the composite, right? This is the quarter inch composite. That's going to go on first because that'll end up being where the real seat will be. Now, I'm using the tray. This is the, the little plastic tray here from CRB. Very easy to work with, and then you can pitch it. I'm going to take a very, very little bit, like a little bit, okay? Tiny, tiny, tiny bit. And then I'm actually going to put it on the cork, and I'm going to rotate it. And I want to keep it away from the mandrel. The reason you can see here, you can actually see this cork kind of getting wet from the glue, right? So we're going to spin it, and that's what we're going to do. I'm actually going to keep the glue away from that mandrel a little bit. Now, if you get a tiny little booger on there, that's, that's honestly not a big deal because you want to be sure that this cork is glued to the mandrel but not permanently glued to the mandrel. So we put a little on there, that one's ready to rock, and then the next one is just going to be your cork ring. So I'm going to take a little bit more. You've got to remember where the camera's at every time I come back. <laughs> So, and then what we're going to do is we're literally just going to put the tiniest little bit and then pull it off, pull it clear, right? Do not, do not pile it on here like this and then wipe it across the middle because all that's going to do is that's going to stack glue there in the middle. Don't do that. It's a mess, but show it anyway. So then we put it down. I always, I slide it down and I give it like a quarter half turn like that. All that does is kind of distribute the glue across those two rings. And I know people use a lot of different uh, adhesives for your cork rings. I use the Pro Paste. I've just been doing it for a long time with the Pro Paste. It's never been a problem. So I always have it. I never have to go, oh man, you know, that glue that I use for the cork, I'm out. And I really want to. I always have Pro Paste. So I'm using the Pro Paste. So again, we just walk through, we put a tiny little bit, and then we turn the popsicle stick on its side. Kind of do a little, little action like that. Got it. Pick the next one up. Another deal. Just barely wiping it around like that. Because we want to fill the voids, but we don't want to leave too much on there. Turn it over. Slide it down. Give me a quarter half turn, and we're ready. So there you go. So you've got that. Now, imagine that we're done with that, because I'm not going to glue all those up. This is, where's the box for this? OK, so this guy here, the deluxe handle clamp. This is a really, really cool device. And I know you guys have seen us use this before. The reason it's so useful is because this has different uh, sliding plates, right? So these different plates have varying inner diameters in here. There's one that's completely closed in. There's one a little larger, a little larger. This one here is a little smaller, right? I use this with a mandrel. And then all you have to do is you just have to tie these guys in a knot, right? And I'll show you here on this one how we do that. In the bottom here, it actually has you know, a cork ring size recess in it. It fits it right in there. And actually, I put that in to the other side. Slide that in. And then all you have to do is just come right over the top like that. And you can see that slot right there fits. So you can actually just pull it off, put it back on, slide it. And then you can actually you know, pull on these here, tighten them up. Or sometimes what you can do is you can take this off. If you don't think it's a snug enough fit, because maybe the last handle you did was a spinning rod and it's, and it's longer, you can actually just pull that off and stack a few more cork rings and, and put it on like that and set it aside. Now, the great part about this that doesn't, you know, some of the other, um, some of the other like cork clamp designs that, don't, that do not have the like slide opening or the varying diameter sizes is <clears throat> there's a lot of guys out there that do some incredible cork work. When did I kick over? Oh, that drill. drill. All right, so there's, a, there's some guys out there that do some incredible cork work. And 
they actually will take and mount the real seat. So, well, of course, I grab that one that doesn't fit. Let me see if that one will fit, just because it's got an end cap. All right, so they mount the real seat, right? And then what you can do is they will actually take each individual cork ring and they will ream it with your extreme reamers and they will glue them up one by one. So you actually take, just like I stacked on the mandrel, just like this guy. So instead of using the mandrel, they're actually taking a ring, they ream it, fit it on the blank, and they dry fit all of them. They number them, dry fit like that, and then they take the next one, dry fit it. So what it is is that cork, there is no chance that you will get a void underneath one of those cork rings that can break, split, wobble, nothing. So you've got, you'll have your seat on, you'll ream a cork ring, fit it perfect. The next one, fit it perfect. Next one. So you'll dry fit them, then you'll pull them all off and stack them in reverse, upside down, and then you'll come back and do the glue just like I did. But the great part about gluing it onto the blank is you glue it to the blank. Yeah. So you're not only gluing it on the blank, but you're gluing them together. And then when you use the deluxe handle clamp, when you're using this guy, this part fits on the base, comes up under the real seat, and then this just slides up and clamps the top of that cork right over the blank. So depending on the different diameters of the blank, this fits all of them. And then what you do is when you want to turn that grip, then you take and you put it in the RBS Pro and turn it right on the blank. There's, there's never an instance because we have all been there. I've done it, I promise you. You take a grip, whether it's a pre-made one like this or it's a custom one like this, and you're reaming it and maybe the taper doesn't match very well and then you have a wobble. And it's, it's just one of those deals where um, it's very frustrating because you spend an enormous amount of time on a custom grip like this and then you ream it and it's incorrect. And it's like, oh man, that's brutal. So anyway, we're going to chuck this in here. Um, a quick secret, I don't know if you guys know. How's that mic? Is that better? Good? All right. So a thing about the RBS Pro is you guys know that it has, let me move this thing. You guys know it has two different types of jaws, right? So the jaws here on the outside, the rubber ones, they actually have like a concave one, in case it's, you know, a really, really large outer diameter. And then they have one with a point. But what you might not know is if you look inside the jaws, there is an even smaller pinch that you can actually take, and that's the one I use when I turn because sometimes I add like a lot of pressure to this. Yeah. Probably more than I should, but I do it anyway, and I tape this up a little bit. And not because the rubber jaws don't hold, but because I just sometimes really work on it. So you can actually take it, chuck it in, and I use the V-belt for this. You know, you get two belts. You get kind of just the round rubber one. You get this, uh, the V-belt that's like fiber. Uh, this one's the deal. This is the one I actually use for all of it. So chuck that one in. And then, you know, we have sanding screen. We've got uh, a couple different types of sandpaper. I actually just start with the sandpaper. Never been, not that I don't like the sanding screen. I just always feel like I don't have it, you know? I just, but you can use this. You can use files. You can use rasps. You know, if, if you're a farrier, you know, you've got rasps. So the problem is, though, is some of those can really chew at this cork, and you got to be careful. So that's why I, will, I would rather turn a grip and it take me twice as long using this than, um, uh, what you call it? I'd rather use the... I'd rather use the sandpaper that takes twice as long than something that might chew that grip up a yeah, little bit. So, good point. How's that, Jay? All right. So what I do, 
lock it in there, get your bands ready, and we're going to turn on here. So, you have any questions coming up? Yeah, um, before you start that, William from YouTube, how long does it take to dry on the mandrel before you start shaping it? Uh, you can do two different options. You can use the standard pro paste, which this is the stuff that I would probably let dry for eight hours, you know, or I'd do it, let it dry overnight, just like if you glue a handle on a bass rod before you start doing anything else. Uh, you can also use the five minute stuff, and it's quicker, um, but because this and turning can generate some heat, I'm a little more careful about being sure that this is glued and bonded and everything before I start getting after it. Because if you get after it too quick, <clears throat> you create heat and then you can you can kind of you can kind of booger it up. And yeah. then it's really hard to go back because then the pieces start separating or the glue is kind of gummy and it's it's just a mess. So if you can, you know, give it a day. I did this one yesterday around like lunch, you know, giving it, you know, 24 hours or you know, a little less, you know, yeah. maybe. That's, that's yeah. fine. I, I just, you don't need to let it go a week, but I'd be hesitant if it was like four hours. Right. Yeah, so. Um, Gerald, how long is a fly rod handle on average? Typically, the reverse half well is gonna be probably starting at seven, go out to seven and a half. The full wells is going to be either seven and a quarter, seven and a half, I don't think I've ever seen one like eight. So yeah. this is typically seven and a half. The reverse half well, some of them are seven and a half as well, but you can see there is a little bit there because these are half inch rings in here. So you got this one at seven and a half, this one at seven, I believe, right? So that's that. Now, what I do when I'm uh, spinning this, when I first start, I'll knock most of it down. And I'll just take, because you have like glue rings and stuff, and you can actually, one of two things, you can take it and fold it a couple times, kind of almost make like a belt, and you can go like this. So you can create like a belt and do it like that. I actually tend to, and when I really, really get after it, safety first. There you go. And then teamwork. And what grit was that, did you say? Um, that's the 120. 120? Yeah. It's a 120. That's ours. So, hopefully you guys can hear me under this stuff. <laughs> nice and foggy. All right, so... Like I said, you can create a belt. I actually tend to wear a glove on this hand because it will get hot. And then I actually create like a little bit of a hoop. I always, I always keep this moving, okay? Always keep it moving. And something that you really have to understand about working with multiple uh, mediums, I guess you would say, is the pieces on the end that are composite sand at a different rate mm. than cork. Cork, you could burn through this grip like right quick. The composite stuff, not so much. Right. So you need to be very careful transitioning and using two different types here. Um, but again, what I do is I work, I knock a lot of the grit down. You know, I, I knock all the glue off. And because see, you can see there's tiny little glue lines. Those glue lines are not going to show when the grip is done, but they show as you knock them down. So I knock that down first, and then I work on one well. So I cut the grip in half. And this is a really good instance here because you know this is your center ring. And I actually, I cut and I work on this one. And then I work on this one. And then I work back and forth like that. And I'm constantly testing it. I, again, just like I'm casting, I'm a, I'm a feel guy. So where I want it to be, 
I just test it like that and go, nah, that's too much. Or I also will pull out one like this, feel it, go, no, 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 yeah, no, you know, like that. So just like with this one, I work here first, work back here, knock it down a little, work here, work there, knock it down a little. So that's how I go about it. And take your time, don't rush that. I mean, that's gonna turn out to be a beautiful piece of cork. Um, so don't rush it. Like I said, you know, I work, I don't work the whole grip the whole time. I work a little here, work a little here. And then even sometimes you have to fold this in a real tight kind of thing and just work right here on your composite because you'll start to do this down and then you got this big ring out here, which is an exaggeration, but then you'll have this ring out here and you need to knock it down to make sure you're following the contour so it's, so it's good. Awesome. Cool. So yeah. I want to give one quick tip before we do a couple questions. Come on. So this is a tip that uh, actually one of my dad's friends from a long time ago, Don Jackson. Yep. Taught, uh, taught me and my dad. I think it's really cool. Now, of course, you can come in and you can do uh, some checkerboard patterns or some, you know, different color cork rings and burl. And so what he taught us was to identify a rod quickly, besides looking at the decal or whatever guide wraps, use your burl accents as, you know, say you got a five weight rod. Yep. Put five burl rings in the middle, space them out evenly. Yep. So that way when you look at it, one, two, three, four, five, that's my five weight, boom, grab it and go. Perfect. So it gives you a little visual representation of what rod you're working with. Yep. You can just grab it and go. So I think it's a cool tip that's kind of I think simple stuff like that that's overlooked yep. that really can put your personal touch on it. I think it's a great point. And I'm actually, let me get the board here real quick. Yep. I know I'm throwing you guys for a loop here, camera guys. Like this? Back, like this? I'm throwing you guys for a loop. I know, I'm sorry. Is it got a big shine on it? No? Well, work with me here. Oh, okay. Yep. All right, so, like Hunter was saying, when you're talking about, like, weights, a lot of the guys, if they don't do it in the cork, they do it on, they do it on the thread, right? So if you're gonna do, your burl rings, because if you've got, for example, a seven inch grip, you're gonna have 14 rings in it, right? So if you're gonna do a, an eight weight, you got eight rings in it, it's like, whew, I'm running out of room, right? right? So rather than making eight marks, right? Rather than doing eight small marks like this, where you have burl, cork, Burl, cork, like that. Mm -hmm. What they will do is, and I don't know if Bob Clouser came up with this a long time ago or not, but they'll also do it in a thread wrap where they will make a solid mark and then go, so this is five. This will always be five. Okay. If you have a solid mark like this wide, that's always a five. I make my fives funny, apparently, I have been told this week. So, I'm trying to make sure, whoop, that's worse. That, kind of, okay. So that's five, and then as you add singles, that's six, seven, eight, nine, and then if it's a 10, you just do five and five. You just do blocks. Hmm. So if you wanna do thread wraps, if you wanna do the cork, so like you said, if you want to do like individual ones, yeah, you do like one, two, three, four with a space in between. And then depending on once you start to get like eight and you're running out, do like three together, one, yeah. two, three to create like a solid and then do one, two, three. And then you'll have five, six, seven, seven eight. eight, yeah, like that. Cool. Yeah. Just something to set your fly rod right handle a little bit different than your buddies. You know? Sorry, guys. I, apo I apologize for throwing the uh, throwing the board. Yeah, <laughs> Jay is like, don't <laughs> you ever do that again. We're back. We're back. We got to use the full. Got to use the whole studio. Um, 
Let's scroll up a little bit on the questions yeah. and hit a couple of those real quick before. Let me get uh, ready for yeah, the Yeah, you, for you the get other ready piece. and we'll do this real quick. Uh, Gary Akers, Mahi on a fly, 10 weight. I uh, hate to throw you on the spot already, but yeah, yeah 10 weight. Yeah. That works. I'd do a 10 weight, uh, even a 9 weight. You know, again, for those guys, uh, for the dolphin, if, if you get around a uh, if you get around a reed line and you get them fired up, you could throw a bear hook at them. But really, you're probably going to throw you know like some kind of an EP minnow fly or, or something like that. And I would have a ten weight ready. We actually did that when we were down in Stewart. Um, I wasn't planning on catching like a pretty big Spanish mackerel, but I just had a large fly and was yeah. you know if we were going to chase a bonita or a dolphin or a Spanish, boom. 10 weight, it's a, it's a great weight to have out there. No telling what shows up. Cool. Uh, Ray, you would never use the five minute epoxy on cork, would you? Um, so here's the thing. Typically, for me at least, when I want to use the, um, the faster drying epoxies, the five minute, the 10 minute, the 15 minute, it's for a quick fix. It's for something that yeah. maybe I just need to repair a handle, repair a reel seat, something quick, easy, so I can go fishing in the next two to three hours, whatever it may be. If I'm doing a, a handle or, uh, or a you know, custom cork handle, or even from scratch, if I'm just doing a new build using a, you know, a bass rod with EVA grips, whatever it might be, I'm gonna use the, the standard pro paste epoxy that cures in you know, eight to 10 to 12 hours. It's gonna have a better bond, um, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Never have to worry about it in the future. Um, with some of your faster drying epoxies, I feel like they just don't have that, that optimum bond, right? They work, they have their place, but not for this type of application. I think it's, I think it's good. Yeah. I think it was, that was well done. Uh, can you put a crosshatch pattern on a fly rod? North Florida Fishing, 42. Crosshatch, I'm thinking like thread wrap? Absolutely. You know, there, there's no reason why you can't do any decorative thread wraps on a fly rod. Uh, you know, especially if it's like a larger weight, you know, if it was a small like two or three weight and you load it up with a bunch of thread wrap and epoxy, it, it might adjust it a little bit, but remember all of that thread work is going to be down in the handle section. It's not going to be mid rod, not out on the tip, nothing like that. So anything you do down in the handle section, you're going to be fine. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, how long is a fly rod handle on average? Did I answer that one? Yeah. yeah. Seven to seven and a half. Seven to seven and a half. Um, Gerald, also, what blank do you recommend for small streams and lakes? Uh, I'm very, very partial to our MHX. It's an 8.64 weight. It's an extra fast out in the tip. It's, it's just a favorite of mine. Um, I know Guffy loves the 9 foot 4 weight. There is just something special. I, I really don't know what it is exactly, but the MHX fly blanks. Both four weights, even the eight foot four weight, the 804, I don't know. There's just, there's just something about yeah. it. Yeah, especially know? for uh, really tight, you know, streams and creeks yeah. where you got overhanging trees and you just you need to make that quick little snap cast. Yeah. It's there's, there's some, the four weight is just right, whether it's the eight six, the nine footer, the eight yeah. footer. I don't know. There's just, there's just something about it. All right, real quick, we got to do this inlet deal. So imagine if this was a perfectly beautiful shaped cork handle and we're going to use a uh, reel seat on it. That has an inlet. This is how, you know, this is how an inlet looks. This is the AFSR 7 and 8, right? Yep. You can see there's, there's a considerable difference in outer diameter. So you have a different size inlet here and an inlet there. The great thing about the Crafty Cutter is it's this little guy here I showed you earlier. It has these wings, right? So it comes in a bag, and I think it has five different size wings on it, right? And it has a little Allen key. And then it has this little guy, which is like a sleeve. A lot, lot, lot of little parts. Don't lose them. Don't put them in your mouth. <laughs> Don't swallow them. So, got these little wings. What you'll do is, you can match it up like this. Right? So this is kind of how you can measure it. Or what you can do is you can put your calipers on this guy here. Put the wing size in here. This one is the three. 
which is a little bit big for this real seat, but I'll show you why because I'm, I'm also using it to inlet a butt. But so this one, I would probably drop down to the two and it would probably be perfect. So you just take the Allen key and these holes right here, they're just set screws, pull them out, pull the wing out, put the two in and they have notches. So this is a three notch, go down to a two notch. And there's, I think one through five. So, and one through five, that expands it out like that and just depending on what size you want. So what we're gonna do is, now that we've got the right size wing cutters in here, we're gonna chuck this in the drill, put the short end in the drill, right? Leave the long end out here. We're going to use this sleeve inside of the cork like this. And I actually will put a little bit of a tape arbor at times because I want it to be a really snug fit. It fits down into there. But you want it to be able to slide because as you drill and go down, you can see it right there just in the edge, kind of shining there. As you drill down, it pushes it and it keeps it centered. Because yes, the inner diameter of these cork rings is a 250, but it's give or take, like a hair. So that's why this sleeve is, is a good option. Then what you're gonna do is I tend to set the cork on something sturdy, and I do it like this. I don't do it like this because I feel like you could get off a little bit, and I'll show you what happens when that happens, but I like to put it in like this and go like this. Now, do not set the drill down. Can you see or is this stand in the way? Good? All right. Do not set the drill down and start. Okay, because it will, it might grab and kick. Uh, it's just like, you know, if you've got a, a big chop saw, you don't set the saw on the material and then pull the trigger because it can jump. You start the saw, saw's running wide open, you ease it down, you make a clean cut, you pick it up, let go of the trigger. Same with this. It's one of those like, go slowly, really fast. I know it sounds silly, but Get the drill running wide open and then slowly lower it in. So we're going to do like this. Right? Get it running wide open. Then we start cutting. Okay. I'm going to show you kind of the progress. You can see it makes a mess. This is, again, another good thing to do in the dining room. Um, so there it is. It's starting to cut a hole, right? Is that good with the light? So it's kind of, it's, it's starting to cut there, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it looks like when it's cutting. Even though I said don't do this, this is the do as I say, not as I do. Patented by parents everywhere. So we're going to start it. And cut. pull it out. What we're going to do is we're going to check the depth, right? So what you, what you want to do is you want it to fit, obviously, whoop, sorry, obviously that's not going to cut it, right? You can still see that's not deep enough, right? What you don't want to do is you don't need to cut halfway through this grip, right? But you want to get it obviously to the lip. So I just cut it to about where I think it's going to be and then check it and go, well, no, we got to do that again and keep cutting. So you come back in and you keep cutting. Up like this, run it wide open, keep cutting. So that is, again, I think you guys don't need to hear the drill over my mic at volume 100. Um, so that is your, that's how you inlet your grip. And again, because this is squishy, it's got rubber in it. It does an incredible job of fitting very, very snug around the top of the real seat. It makes a beautiful cut. You saw here, this, this piece is, I mean, it's a perfect cut. It really is. The, the having the composite and then cutting with this, it, it is perfect. Now, I'm gonna show you what not to do just because I think everybody deserves that. 
So let me knock this out here real quick. You gotta, you gotta pull the, the insert out and then you'd ream it and then you'd glue it to your blank. Now, let me tear one up because I like to do that. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna put this in here. You can see it actually like doesn't fit quite as well but you would just take and add a little piece of, uh, what you call it? You'd add a little piece of, uh, oh, it's eight o'clock. Um, you'd add a piece of uh, tape there. So I'm gonna do this just for what I should have done a minute ago, but put this in here. See that? How bad that is? That's because I didn't get the drill started. You just take it and set it here. See how it wants to catch? See that? Don't do that, okay? See, I just slung a piece off there, like this. That's a mess. Don't do that, okay? So again, don't do that. Don't do that. Get it, get it started, run that thing wide open, and ease it down to it. So you would actually take it. This is obviously does not have the insert in it. and then you'd ease it down like that, okay? So that is a cool. what to do, what not to do. And let me show, we got any questions? Uh, there's a couple. Uh, Grant, what about wood glue to glue cork? Um, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? I mean, I, there are people that do it. I just don't personally do it. Yeah, I just. I, it's one of those things like we we use what we know works. Um, you could try it. Uh, no guarantees. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just wouldn't do it. Mark, are you letting the weight of the drill cut? Or are you pushing it? Are you pushing the bit? Um, I I'm not letting the weight of the drill cut because it it just won't quite do it, especially with the especially with the composite. This stuff is actually pretty dense. Like. You, you really got to kind of lean on it, but you do not just, you don't attack it. So what I do is I get it going and I let the weight of the drill fall in a controlled manner till it starts touching it. Then what I do is then I just gently add constant pressure little by little until the bit starts to make its cut. And then I just carry that pressure throughout. I don't just attack it, and then I don't just like set the drill on it, but I do let the weight of the drill settle onto the composite, let the cut start to begin, and then slowly start to add pressure. That's why I try to have an anchor spot so that I'm only adding pressure from one direction. I'm not adding pressure from two directions, and then you start to get off. So set it down, let the weight, and then slowly add pressure. Cool. cool. Let's do one more, and then uh, we got a giveaway, and we got to wrap it up. Yeah. So I got to do the the coin in the butt. Oh yeah. yeah. But go ahead. Michael uh, from YouTube, how do you get the handle off after it dries, once you realize you have made a mistake? So we've we've probably all been there, right? Oh yeah. Oh, there is yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Michael. There's Quite no the there's no easy way to do this. The best way is probably to make um, you know if you take your grip here, take a um, you know, a fresh, sharp razor blade, uh, an X-Acto knife, something like that. Make a couple cuts um, along this grip, you know, make th three or four, you know, turn it every nine degrees, make a cut. And then you can use pliers, um, whatever, to grab that cork and you can try to peel it off. If it's a fresh handle, something you've just done, more than likely it's not going to peel off exactly like an older rod would. Um, it's gonna be messy. It's it's gonna to be tough. It's not easy. Yeah. It's doable, but that's uh, that's just one option that you can do. Yeah. Once you get it down to you know the little parts and pieces that are left, you can kind of sand that down uh, to the blank. Just be careful. Don't really dig into the blank if you can uh, help it. Don't damage the blank at all. But it's not an easy process. It's not. But it's, it's doable. If it you is. need to. It's doable. Um, okay, real quick, we're gonna do kind of somewhat of this. So this is a, this is a Euro coin. 
that I got uh, while the wife and I were traveling in Spain a number of years ago. And I did it in this one because this is the 763 weight. Uh, it's, it, it is the native MHX. It's the one that you saw with uh, the red thread wraps. Uh, you can see, though, I did a full here. It's like a modified, I call it more of a snub nose because it's not full wells like that. But what I did <clears throat> is I didn't do an inlet here. I actually used a barrel seat with a carbon fiber insert. Just something that's weird and different and I was just experimenting a little bit and I thought it came out great. Now, what I did is because the wife uses this rod to catch trout. She loves it. Seven, six, three weight and she wears them out on it. Now, Again, we took the trip to Spain, so I used a Spanish Euro and I put it in there, right? Now, how do we do that? So you can see this fighting butt has like a little bit of a swoop to it. It actually has the green composite. So this is the composite cork that has a green tint to it. The blank's green, this is green. I know, that's fancy, right? Uh, so what I did is I actually used the cork ring holder and I use the crafty cutter to cut this in here. So that's, that's how we're gonna do that and I'll show you why I did it that way in a second. All right, so you saw I cut it here with a crafty cutter, but what happens if you only have a tiny little fighting butt, right? What are we gonna do? We're gonna use the CRB cork ring holder, right? And I thought I did one earlier. So here is a single one that we did just like that, okay? So you can do it a number of different ways. If you wanna use a burnt ring, put you a burnt ring in here. Get the insert. Okay. Safety first. We're gonna get our crafty cutter back in this bad boy. Okay. You can see the insert's hanging out, right? Now what you can do is you can glue two rings together and then have it like that, or you can just do one ring. Now this is also handy for when I was telling you the guys were reaming each individual cork ring, gluing it and stacking it. This is another great option to do that. So we pinch this here, put this guy in, right? And then I'm, I'm gonna go like this. Now granted, I can't set this one down. Sorry, Nick. I can't set this one down, but I'm going to start up. Okay. Got that? It's amazing. You can actually smell like the burn and the, the burn. <laughs> All right. So, and then pull this guy out. Pull your insert out. And then actually fits a nickel pretty good. So that's just a standard nickel, right? The reason I did that is just because the nickel just so happened to fit the same size wings that we were using to cut this stuff. So you can do that with this guy and then glue it up, put it in a lathe, put it in your RBS Pro, turn her down, glue her up. You can do it like that. You can also use an EVA butt cap. So, all right, purchasing guy, what, what we got some part numbers here? This is an EBC. Two or three. Yeah. So it's an EBC, but it's in a matrix, so you can find yep, these. EBC. So this is an EBC, and then this is S a... SGFBE? See, you didn't think I was going to put you on spot. How about that? They'll put a link in, so yeah. we'll be good to go. I think that's... So these fit up, right? Okay, they're going to fit up. If you want to put a coin in here, it's very easy because, you know, there's enough material. Now, the cheat with this is, is when they make these, they leave a little dimple in here and the dimple is in the dead center. So what you can actually do is you can take, I mean literally, you can take a brush. You can take a brush or a, a bodkin or something and you can actually just press through. I swear I've done it before. Okay, you can press through like that. Now you're in the center, okay? You got a center spot and then because you press through with the brush, the hole's so tiny that you don't, and you have such thin material here to work with, 
it's tough to get this insert in here, right? So because that's so such a small hole, you can actually just go right in it. Now again, please be careful with this because this will chew your fingers to no end. So just be careful. Felt like you were breathing a little heavy for that one. <laughs> like you were too. Yeah. Well, I was. You, you know, played it off cool though. It. So we got one of these guys here. We got one of those here earlier. Um, I swear I did another one. I don't know. I did a couple of them, but we did one of these guys. So it, it's all the same. You could put this guy in a ring if it was big enough, but you see, that's not going to work, right? So you got to hold it. Um, but this way, if you want to do one of these fighting butts, you can actually take it and use your CRB ruler. Mm -hmm. Take a pencil. You'll actually measure, right? Do a measurement, make a mark. Pull your measurement, make a mark. That's how you'll get your center there. So obviously do it a little more Pay a little more attention than I right, just did there. Right. But that's how you get your center there. Or, you know, if you've got this guy, you just cheat and uh, use the inside. And then, again, you can just put your coin in here. Boop. Fits nice and flush. It wants to fall out because it's not glued in, but still pretty good, huh? Here's your coin. Cool. Whoop. So do you glue, do you put glue on the inside of that recess? Yeah. And then you just... Yeah, I just, what, a paste epoxy or liquid yeah. epoxy, mm -hmm. and yeah. then you just put a uh, pro coat over the top of that? You can. You know, you can put, so if you've got this and you put the coin in, depending on how you want, like that one is like, that one's like perfect, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to put pro coat or if you've got like a decal or whatever, cut it deeper and then put it on a very level surface. I'm talking very level. Measure twice cut once kind of thing, mm -hmm. set it down like that, perfectly level, and then mix your pro coat and add your pro coat in there and it'll settle out and then it'll kind of seal it. <laughs> so, and then it'll, and then it will be level like that. Yeah. But what I did with that cut and then what I did with <clears throat> this guy is the coin is, the coin's just flush. The reason I did that is because I think it's kind of cool when you can be like, man, that's a coin, and you can like feel its texture. Rather than like, is that a sticker? Right. Or is that like fake or what is it? And like, no, it's real. So cool. Yeah. Awesome. That's it. A little extra flair, a little custom little touch that you just don't yeah. get on other rods. Well, you know, you there was a lot of guys doing uh, some of the dome decals. It's got their logo on it. I know some people were asking about that in the group and that is a really, really cool way to put your loco on it. And I think it really pays off. Um, and, you know, forgive me, I, I don't remember the guy's name that was doing it. But I know if you're a member of the uh, Mudhole Live Rod Builders Workshop, and if you're not, again, you're missing out. But uh, the builder that was doing it was putting his logo and stuff in it, or he was putting, you know, an NFL team or whatever. But it's great for your logo because if it's an on ice blank, the diameter is so tiny it's hard to get a decal on there that says, yeah. you know, Hunter's Custom Rods or whatever. So it's, it's great to put it under the cap because then you get a cool logo. You can get the dome style decal, cut it, epoxy it, put finish in there if you want to. Super cool. And it's, and it's great. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Let's see. We're going to give something away? Why don't you give away the grand prize? Oh, uh, Okay. <laughs> I see why you did that. I'm quick. I think baby. I'm being set up here. No, not you, Hunter, not you. All right, well, thank you guys for sticking around. Hope you enjoyed the show. We do have a grand prize, a CRB fly rod. So this is going to be a full kit, I'm assuming. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Fly, the blank, the guides, yep. the grips. So we got, all we got three weights to choose from, yep. six colors. You can do whatever grip you want. We got multiple fly seats. Got wood ones, got all aluminum ones. Uh, you got the new CRB guides to choose from. Put you an LZR stripper in there. Yep. Whew. I'm telling you, this is the deal. So go ahead. Cool. So 
Justin, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up your last name, but I'm going to give it a shot. Justin Vander... Vander... Code? Code? Vander Cod? Vander Code? Sure. Justin, congratulations. Justin, congratulations. <laughs> Starts with a V, got a bunch of stuff. Justin, I think you know who you are, bud. Yeah. I think, I think you know who you are. So yeah. congratulations, grand prize, the CRB Fly Rod. And for all of the winners, Ken, Ken I think knows the deal. Ken's been around. We love seeing Ken in the group. Ken Blanchard, Peggy Boyless, and Justin V. Um, slide in to the Mudhole DMs, and we're going to need a name. Uh, if you know your account number, put that in there, please. Yep. If you don't know your account number, but you know you have an account, give us an email address. Give us your mailing address. We just want to make sure we can get it to you. Nice and easy. Very seamless. So get in there. Slide into our DMs. Uh, congratulations to those three winners for the Fly Guide kit. Got a handle kit and, of course, the big winner. It's a fly rod. And I love it. I love it. Very cool. So, perfect. Well, I tell you what. It's 8.15. I mean, I figured... If it's gonna be the first one back, we better we better keep you for a little bit. We gotta make it right. Yeah, you know? and uh, you know we were we were uh, utmost prepared that we don't have a topic for the next show, but we did that on purpose. We want to know you guys have been at home building, thinking, studying the rod building craft. What do you want to hear? That's why we did the fly rod build. You know, had a lot of people say, "Hey, give show the fly guys some love," which for me. You know, I've been banging on that door for a while. I think it I think it played well. You know, even if you're not somebody that's building a fly rod, we showed a lot of different options that you'll carry over, whether you're going to do the butt thing uh, with an inlet, whether you're going to do, you did the ferrule wraps. You did stuff like that for multi-piece rods. Um, and for those that are doing the fly stuff, run over to mudhole.com. There is a CRB fly category, and that is all the CRB stuff we talked about tonight. The guides, the real seats, handles, blanks, all of that stuff is there in one spot for the CRB stuff. You are not, trust me, trust me when I say this, you're not gonna build a better fly rod for that little money. I mean, we're talking 100 bucks, under 100 bucks to build a really cool looking and a great fishing fly rod. Um, we can attest to it. We've been fishing them. We put them, put them to the test in a bunch of different situations. They're great. So. Definitely. I mean, we caught some very, very large rainbows yeah. doing a couple different things. And anybody can fish them. Anybody can build them. And you're not going to find it for a better price. So run over there. That's the CRB fly category page on mudhole.com. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what else we got? All right, thank you guys again. Um, hope all of you are safe, healthy, continue to be that way. Uh, I know it's been a tough couple, couple months for yeah. everyone. So. Yeah, it has We'll definitely get through this. Uh, thank you for your patience. And I know a lot of you guys are experiencing, you know, backwaters right now. And, you know, trust me, this, this stuff is, it's coming in, like I said, daily. We're getting, yeah. we're getting stuff in. We're trying to restock our shelves. Uh, but if you do have some stuff that is on backwater, feel free to reach out to us. Our sales reps, our customer service guys yeah. and girls will, they will help you. They'll try to get you something in stock that you can switch it over to. Uh, so reach out to us. We're here to, here to help. So yeah, and we you know we do that honestly. We do it daily. You know somebody needs a, a certain guide or needs a certain tip top or you know maybe he wanted uh, size eight and we're like well you know you could go with size sixes for those runners. Tell us you know what line you're using. Are you doing this or you doing that? Oh no, it's, sixes would actually be okay. Well we got sixes in stock. Let's use sixes and we'll yep. and we'll get them out too. You know or if there's a certain color of something or, or a thread color or you know, like, well, this one is, is also close to that. We can sub some stuff out. Um, you know, like Hunter said, I know you deal with it a lot daily. This is, this is our man right here. So he's, he's dealing with it, but, you know, we're, we're doing a lot for our customers because we, we just couldn't appreciate y'all enough. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us uh, for the fly rod build. Yeah. For the first one back. Yeah. Feels Be sure good. to stay tuned to uh, Facebook, YouTube, the... Uh, the Mud Hole Live Rod, Rod Workshop, workshop on, yeah. uh, on Facebook. Perfect. Um, all that good stuff. I think we that's a, great. Yeah, we've got a lot of new stuff coming down the pipeline I'm soon. I'm talking a lot of new stuff. So, uh, it's it's yeah. going to be great. Springtime, summertime is going to be really, really cool this year. So yep. stay tuned. Yep, and we got uh, the new flyers are dropping soon. 
So, uh, you know, we, we, we put some cool little, some, uh, some design work in there. The guys, uh, Taylor and Hoffman, they do a lot of long hours designing. Uh, so it's cool. I think you guys are going to think you guys are going to love it. We even do like a little behind the scenes on this. I yeah. think, I think we do a little of that. So it's, it's a great flyer, but, uh, I think we'll let you guys go. Uh, we got to get the shop back in here for Hunter to clean up yep. and, uh, that'll be it. So for all of us here, the, I mean the whole team, the whole team, plus, you know, all the marketing guys, we got Taylor and Guffy in the war room. They're the ones posting links and answering questions. Of course, we got Nikki Mintz on the cameras, Jay Bird on the ones and twos. Hunter, as always, I'm Chris Adams. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on Mudhole Live. Have a safe one. Take Thanks, care. guys.